2,000 years ago yeah. uh, in, in uh, Europe for keeping sheep inside of, of uh, fenced in areas is like still the best method. It is a one way opening with a rock on a string that then, <laughs> <laughs> that then pulls the gate shut behind you yeah. with gravity. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It was invented, you know, thousands of years ago and it still is the best. Sonder, by the way, that was the, the first tree that you ever walked the first into. Time I've seen it. <laughs> For as much as Sonder walks backwards in all these the, all his funny. filming career, that was we made <laughs> the history. first time. We made history. I <laughs> love it. At least the tree didn't knock you out. <laughs> in the last video here on Flock, we took a look at a low mo native lawn with Todd Bittner, the director of natural areas for the Cornell Botanic Gardens. Knowing that we are interested in regenerating the forest on our land, he took us to the Mundy Wildflower Garden to check out the results of their deer exclusion fence. All right, so we are here, you'll see this, deer management. <laughs> and I'm here with Todd again, and we're actually going to take a look at this site because what's interesting about this, as we're starting to assemble our own deer fence, is what happens when you actually exclude deer, right? And we're in a really good test case uh, right here. And can you explain why? Sure, so we're still in the Money Wildflower Garden. And what I wanted to start the conversation with was to have you look like a deer, right? <laughs> so we're outside Wait, the I'm deer exposure. <laughs> no, well, not, not that far, but you know, putting your head down yeah. at deer height yeah. and see how far you can see through the woods. Yeah. We can see, other than the cow parsnip that's yeah. in the front of us, we can see 100 yards. Yeah. There's no understory mm -hmm. in here. Mm -hmm. We've been managing deer on campus mm -hmm. for quite some time. We're still not meeting our management goals, and we still don't have a significant amount of woody plant recruitment mm -hmm. from 10 inches up to two feet, six feet, and so on. And you could see that browse line through the woods still. But I would imagine some people would be like, but we like deer browse because we can see and it's easy to walk through the woods, right? Well, would we're some people say that we're fa we're favoring one species over a significant number of other species. Right. They're depressing the biodiversity, the abundance of these plants. And, you know, we're we're dealing with things like emerald ash borer. Mm -hmm. And so we need recruitment to replace the trees in the canopy. And if the deer are, st are browsing that and keeping anything from growing over your knee height, mm -hmm. How could they ever get in the canopy and replace what we are losing from some of these forest right. pests? And when you talk about recruitment, you're talking about uh, seeds naturally falling and then off and on the ground and then growing up and creating like many different layers right. within the forest canopy. Absolutely. And right canopy. now, the average uh, seedling height that we have is about 16 inches high, which is about the average snowpack that we have in the winter. And essentially the snow is keeping the deer from eating things shorter than that. I see. And so, it, and it's not just here in uh, uh, Ithaca, it's our whole region. Mm -hmm. Our uh, deer browse is really one of the most significant conservation issues that we have. Now, w why is that for folks? Because oftentimes when we think about like an invasive species, we get it. It comes in, it bullies out the others, it creates a monoculture. What is it that we've done that have uh, made deer populations, I'm assuming it's something that we've done, <laughs> um, that have made deer populations explode? Sure. Well, it is something that we've done. We've made the perfect deer habitat. They love fragmentation, edges, different habitats. If you look at our agricultural landscape, that's ideal for them. They love areas where there aren't any predators we remove the predators from the system. Mm -hmm. Other than hunters, right, or our cars, sadly, is also a population control on deer. Uh, those are the things that are regulating their population. So they can essentially grow unchecked w with those two exceptions. And if you don't have deer that you're using lethal means for, it's gonna be cars. You know, you, for you forgot one more thing that um, we've done is Disney's Bambi. <laughs> <laughs> That did have a significant influence. So, but that's one of the reasons that we built the uh, deer exclosure behind us so that pe it's one thing to tell people mm -hmm. what is the situation mm -hmm. and it's another for them to get to see it for themselves. So let's do that yeah. now. So we have a five acre deer exclosure here, eight foot high woven wire fence on treated lumber posts. And, and is eight foot the minimum you should go or? Eight feet is the maximum that you should go. Okay. Um, we have much more of a possibility of deer coming in 
to the exclosure by going under the fence right. than over it. Okay. It, unless can it, can it even fit under here? No, uh, it, not so much. It, no, this they actually yes they actually yeah. could get under there. Yeah. So this used to be higher. This is how much uh, how the, popular our trail is <laughs> yeah. that it got worn down over time. <laughs> but um, just take a look at how striking it is about the woody plant vegetation. Yeah. You know, from your ankle high to however uh, high up mm -hmm. we saw the muscle wood earlier. Mm -hmm. We have a spice bush that's in here. We have uh, you know maple ash. Uh, hickory sycamore recruitment that's right. going on for some of the canopy uh, species. Alternate leaf dogwood I see here yeah. is one of their favorites. Yeah, you would they, never... The dogwood seems to like somewhat come back. It's it, like we have a lot of like Cornus cerisia and I'm like, oh, red stems again because yeah. the deer ate it back. You yeah, know? so the, um, the dogwoods are definitely a favorite yeah. and you won't see any that are actually, you know, growing to any type of uh, height. typical height yeah. in areas that have really Which high deer a, browse. It's a beautiful understory tree, you know, and when it gets to a, 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 a point, a height. You yes, know, it I, is. Yeah. And, and, you know, the uh, deer eat vegetation preferentially. They're mm -hmm. really good botanists. They mm -hmm. know what it is that they're eating. Mm -hmm. And so we call the ones that they really are interested in preferred browse species. Mm. And so, and it can differ by site and uh, region, but those are the ones to really clue in on to determine what the level of impact is to your particular area. Interesting. So for example, beach is one of the least preferred. So there's lots of beach, you go in the woods and if you're trying to determine if there's a deer uh, abundance issue, don't look at the beach. Mm. Look at oak seedlings, uh, look at white pine seedlings, look at dogwoods, look at viburnums. Mm. Those are uh, almost universally always preferred for uh, browse. And those are the ones to measure and quantify and look to see, are they setting fruit? Are they flowering? Are they getting eaten down year over year and getting more diminutive? Yeah. The winter was so bad this year. We saw it on hemlocks, we saw it on rhododendrons, we saw it on just about everything. They were, they had a sort of desperation year where they, they ate the bark off of everything yes. too, so. Yeah, the amount of snow that we had was really significant yeah. and it put a lot of pressure on them. They use up a lot of fat reserves Yeah. and you know, they didn't want to starve, so yeah. they got to eat something. Yeah. But we've so we've had this exclosure in here since 2008, so about 13 years it's of development. Lot. Yeah. And before we put it in, it looked pretty similar outside the exclosure mm -hmm. to inside the exclosure. Mm -hmm. So it does take time for it to uh, kind of bounce back. The way I look at it is, uh, it's kind of like a pendulum. And if the pendulum swings too far towards the area being impacted by deer, mm -hmm. then you have to be that much more aggressive to swing the pendulum back to mm -hmm. allow it to recruit and, and recover. So the sooner that you address a overpopulation of deer, the less effort it takes to kind of get things to get back into balance. Right, you know, one of the things that we went and you'd mentioned before, Smith Woods, they started getting Trillium back and everything along those lines within two years, which I was like amazed right. by. Now, it, you could still see quite a ways, so they probably have quite a ways. This is 13 years. When did you really feel like, wow, this was this was, uh, this was a miraculous recovery? Yeah, it was about three or four years in, and okay. it, there was a very evident uh, uh, change that happened. But you mentioned Trillium. It's a really good one to key in on. So I, we have some over here. It might be a little past bloom time. Well, but, but still, I think it's uh, going to be informative because yeah. Uh, a lot of these spring woodland wildflowers are uh, corm uh, um, storage systems for their their nutrients and resources. Right, which is similar to like a like a bulb, right? You know, underground. Yeah, so that's where the storage is. Exactly, and so uh, here they are. So um, here you have, and, and it's evolutionarily why mm -hmm. they're adapted to grow before the canopy fully closes, because mm -hmm. it's a sprint to the finish to mm -hmm. get to flower as early as you can and set fruit as early as you can before light becomes limiting. Right. And so they've come up with that adaptation strategy to pack all those resources into that corm so that they can, and they do, they mm -hmm. just, in two days, it's like, hey, there's a plant and a flower, it's so, it's so glorious, right? So you can think about that corm as being a bank yeah. of resources. And the, the more the deer browse on it, the less it can kind of deposit back in the bank for the next year. Right. And the less of the uh, browse impact, the more it is able to kind of keep it going. Mm -hmm. and, and you can measure that by the height of the stem. Fascinating. And so the, uh, you know, 
if you have trilliums mm -hmm. that only get to be that tall. Kind of like mowing your lawn with the penstemon. That's yeah. telling you something, yeah. right? Whereas here you have, full, you know, full adults, right? They're, yeah. you know, eight, 10, 12 inches. Some of the height in here is gonna depend on the soil fertility and things like that. Right. Um, and, you know, we have them, an another measure is just whether or not they're able to flower right. and set fruit. The deer love the flowers, they love the fruits. So in those uh, other areas, if your trilliums are not reproducing, mm -hmm. they're not gonna persist long term yeah. as well. So you could tell that this was not mowed by deer lips. <laughs> yes, exactly. So woody plants uh, that are preferred browse are yeah. great indicators. Trilliums are great indicators. Now they don't dig up the corm, do they? No. Because if they were able to come back, then I would imagine that the corm is still under there. Yeah, they, they don't really have the, the, the tools to do yeah. that quite the same. No um, opposable thumbs, you know, to create the, <laughs> <laughs> create the tool. But yeah, and so the, uh, you know, it's in the, uh, trilliums are in the lily family. Yeah. All So all lily plants are yeah. also good Very indicators tasty. for yeah that orchids as well mm -hmm. and uh, so those are uh, uh, good ones to key in on mm -hmm. in your woods to kind of gauge what the uh, browse pressure mm -hmm. is now you had mentioned that uh, you have done this over the course of 13 years is there ways where you could say from like um, was this year five? Was this year six? Or, or do you have photos of that actually? Um, we, we, what we actually have is data from plots that oh, we've great. been sampling that uh, show some of the uh, vegetation response from inside mm -hmm. of the exclosure. And then we have plots that are outside so that we can see how it changes over time. That's, that's amazing. And so that's a really good thing to do just for your restoration as well. Yeah is to have some of that data to be able to, to compare. And some of it can be pretty intensive, you know, in terms of setting down plots and sampling transects. vegetation, <laughs> transects and so on. But it can also be qualitative yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, photo you, monitoring as well is I a good a one. I hear a Todd Bittner class coming <laughs> to the <flock. laughs> Pho Photo monitoring is a good one as well. Setting yeah. up permanent plots and you take uh, photos uh, from that position over time at the cardinal directions. Mm -hmm. And you can be able to quantify changes that happen visually. Because yeah. it's hard to remember what something looked like five years yeah, ago. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's always, it's always impressive because even when from the time when we took out some of the garden beds to now, I was like, oh my God, look at two weeks and there's so much growth. And it was so funny that you mentioned, you know, the trillium and we have a lot of these spring ephemerals that grow up um, that we don't think about in this native wood. And it was so funny because I was doing a, a flower bed the other day and it was under this maple and I planted a lot of, you know, trillium, like, you know, there's just like things that are like more spring ephemerals in the shade garden. And people are like, why are you planting directly under a tree? And I'm like, no, you don't understand. This loses its leaves. And in the spring, you get the flush under the, under the tree because it, it needs to move really quickly. And that's some of the first blooms that you actually see. So I'm glad you mentioned that because some folks don't actually understand, like in this forest that you see now where it's all the shade, there's like, how can something actually possibly grow? Um, but there are really shade loving and shade tolerant plants right. as well. Yeah, and you know, things are a little bit uh, non showy at the moment mm -hmm. because of the shade that mm -hmm. you get during the middle of the summer, but in the fall it picks up again as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, one of my favorite plants here is the zigzag goldenrod mm -hmm. that we're looking at. And the goldenrods and the asters zigzag. really take off during the fall, September, October, and it's the same thing. You know, you get more light because the leaves start coming down. Yeah. And these plants uh, have been sitting, growing slowly through the su summer yeah. and then really take off in the, in the late fall. So Amazing. do you want to go see another deer exclosure, a different yeah, construction method? Absolutely, let's do it. Yeah, and what, what's, um, you know, a fence like that, I mean, I would imagine that you know, it's not available to, to everyone. Um, what, are, what are some other things that like maybe a landowner or a homeowner could do or to consider um, as far as like keeping the deer off the land? Well, eating them <laughs> I, is a suggestion that I have. So I, I run the university's deer management program and you know, I am an advocate for that. It's it tastes good. Mm -hmm. It's antibiotic free. It's good for the environment. And uh, it doesn't have a carbon footprint. You didn't have to, you know, ship it across the sea uh, to get here or from California or wherever. Mm -hmm. So How do it's a true locavore <laughs> movement. How do people deal with it, like maybe in a suburban area where like the hunting is, uh, is you know, iffy because there's so many houses around. Yes. Like what, what, 
what are people doing? Is it, are they doing anything? Actually? People put up fences yeah. for, principally. You yeah. know, uh, there's a, suggestions that there are uh, landscaping that's less desirable for deer, mm -hmm. and it really depends on how hard the deer or how high the deer pressure is. Right. You can also put on a deer repellent that either smells bad or tastes bad or whatever, mm -hmm. but it, it washes off as soon as the rain after comes. After a rain, yeah. and you got to do it again. So yeah. those are all, you know, expensive, high maintenance kinds of systems yeah. to try to be able to have your urban garden, which is unfortunate that that's kind of where we're at. But yeah, and I think a lot of the deer resistant stuff that's out there on the market is, you know, might make you bristle in the sense that it's it's maybe from Asia or from somewhere else right. that's not a native plant because maybe they didn't grow up eating it. <laughs> yeah, the deer, you know? deer don't uh, like boxwood. Yeah. You know, you just want to have a whole boxwood garden and oh that's pretty God, dull. I hate boxwood. <laughs> Sandra knows, I'm like, boxwood. <laughs> Well, actually, that's another good point that you just bring up, like with deer ticks. I mean, I know that deer aren't the only ones that carry ticks, but do you, can you see any type of reduction of, of ticks when you exclude deer or, or not so much? Is there any studies on that? Um, it's pretty complicated. Oh, Wait, lovely. Yeah. The garter? It is. Yeah. He wants to go up, but he's like, this is... <laughs> It's a steep hill. <laughs> and there's no brush. Yeah. <laughs> it's all deer brows. <laughs> Well, on. this is actually More. impacted by worms here. That's oh, do you have jumping it, worms? We do. Oh yeah. my gosh! We have about every worm you could imagine, but yeah. So no, no soil <laughs> from here. <laughs> so yeah, he, it's harder to get in the ground when when you have worms if yeah. you're a snake. But um, you know, it's it is a combination. Uh, small mammals are a reservoir for uh, the Lyme uh, disease yeah. itself. But the life stage and the life history is pretty involved. But at the end of the day, they need deer mm -hmm. to be able to keep it going. Right. And so reducing, if you want to reduce ticks, reducing deer is a, is a very practical way to do it. Right. Reducing the small mammal population is... Next to impossible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're up here at the, uh, the other exposure, and this one came to mind because it's probably going to be a little bit more cost effective for you. I mean, you. it looks like a tennis net. It is, um, it is. Yeah, very high tennis it's net. A, it's a poly, um, it's a poly net. So not that different than what you can get commercially. And we actually did buy this commercially. Uh -huh. So the it's trick is, snap, yeah, it, it, it does um, require maintenance because over time it's gonna, but really any deer fence is gonna need some maintenance yeah. and need to be replaced. But if you're in a forest, it's a lot more practical and if you're in a rocky forest, it's very much more practical mm -hmm. because it is not easy to put posts in our rocky Finger Lakes yeah, geology around really here. That's really true, yeah. And, you know, or, or your um, yeah. area that you're, you're dealing with where the gravel had gravel. all been, uh, it is not easy to, to be able to put posts mm -hmm. in the ground. And it's hard even when it's in a forest if you're trying to navigate with like a skid steer or, so, or like something that is going to pound the posts. You right, know? And, and, and the roots that are in the way and so on. So yeah. this, this system oh, is set with these so have, yeah. eyelets up here. I see. That you uh, drill into the tree. And you know, those are just from the hardware store. Yeah, because typically what people would do is they, they attach it to the tree down and that could damage the tree, but it's just this it's little just one. eyelet. Yeah. Right. Well, the tree eats up and it, it, Yeah ends up eating the fence. As it grows, yeah. Which is why we left a little bit of a gap there, yeah. so we gave us some space. Um, but the eyelet actually allows you to be able to back it out, too, if you wanted to. Ugh, I just crushed it with my finger, sorry. <laughs> it's nasty. I thought I was doing a favor. <laughs> it's cute. I really flick it. Uh, no, it's... Not to work <laughs> so, uh, so then the next part of the system is this cord, which is monofilament line. It's okay. just really thick. So this is like fishing line. I was going to say, isn't that thing that you could zip line But on? it is just a really fat <laughs> diameter. Yeah. And um, you get in a really long uh, spool, mm -hmm. and then there's a special... And uh, if we see one, I'll show, I'll point it out, but there's a special uh, ratchet mm -hmm. where the two pieces go through and then you pull it tight and mm -hmm. it kind of ties it together. Mm -hmm. So then you have this uh, ring around the, the, the tree. We, we shoot for about seven feet high. Yeah. 
and this is eight feet total, mm -hmm. to give us an extra foot at the bottom that then J shapes out uh -huh. and helps to uh, make sure you have continuous contact of the fence despite undulations in the landscape. Right. And uh, we'll take random logs that are, uh, you know, wherever and yeah. kind of put them down on the bottom. If you really needed to, you could put another cord right. uh, to, t to tie it at the bottom as well. But can, it, can a deer, okay, sometimes a deer running full force, if they're really scared, I would imagine could break through this, but then it's cheaper to probably fix. It is, uh, often they'll bounce off of it, and that actually doesn't happen that often. Yeah. They don't really run helter-skelter through the woods. Unless you have a bunch of hunters. Hunter well, but yeah. even, <laughs> e even then, um, they don't usually run that far and yeah. then they stop okay. and, and try to disappear. Right. So it's pretty rare for them just to bowl over your, your fence. But then uh, either zip tied here or we have these hog rings that are the same things that you put on the end of your sausage casings yeah. and you crimp on and we then just hang the fence from huh. that cord and there's your, there's your fence. And then I, we have- I love it. It's like more MacGyver style. It's like the <laughs> DIY. I could get it all from the hardware store down the street and, uh, and wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. I have a deer fence. It's something that you can do without <laughs> being a professional fence yeah. installer. Or if you just have a little orchard. Right. And you don't want to go and get a price. You just, and you just want to put it around and, and let the trees get big enough. That kind of thing. I could see this being very practical. Right. And yeah. um, if you do have a tree come down on it, mm -hmm it does have some give to it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get crumpled like a metal fence and yeah. then you have to kind of fix it. Uh, and then at the, uh, wherever you want an entrance, mm -hmm. you have the two pieces of fabric kind of overlap mm -hmm. and then you just kind of unfold it and you mm -hmm. can walk in and then, you know, fold it back out. You could put little beads on it and you get the hookah <laughs> effect. <laughs> you know, it's Ithaca, by the way. <laughs> so we, we've had this here. Now this one's about four or five years old. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we could see a lot of the similarities and differences in terms of what's growing outside the height of the vegetation. Yeah. Uh, um, it's being continuous from your ankles up to yeah. above your head as opposed to what we've seen uh, outside as well. So that's just within the last four or five years. And have you seen trillium and stuff like, or, you know, the kind of like spring ephemerals come up in, in this area? Or so is it a different kind of site that doesn't have it, much It is, and a lot of that has to do with land use history. Okay. And that's a really great question. Mm -hmm. So um, in my restoration ecology class, mm -hmm. the first lab that we do is reading the landscape. Mm -hmm. So let's walk up here and I'll, sh I'll give you one of those clues that we suggest people look for. Did I matriculate in university again? <laughs> <laughs> So, example of the eating of the fence. Yes, but what this is telling us is that we have a history of grazing on right. the site, uh, whether it was uh, cattle or horses or sheep or all of the above, but that has a huge impact on what was able to persist mm. here. And so it changes our expectations for what might spontaneously grow back mm -hmm. once we've excluded deer from the site. Um, so we have gotten a lot of things not a lot of spring ephemerals. Yeah. Those are ant dispersed seeds mm -hmm. and it takes decades and decades for those to get moved around naturally as opposed to us. So if we were up here putting spring ephemeral seeds up here, we would expect to be seeing them now. Yeah. But for them to show up after they've been locally extirpated from yeah. the site, it, uh, that expectation is unrealistic. And the purpose for you to put up these fences is to see what naturally happens as opposed to saying, okay, I'm gonna do some enrichment planting here or do, we, do some right. seeding. Well, we have 3,600 acres of areas that we have to manage. So, so many other things. We're try, we yeah. try to be practical, but <laughs> yeah. you know, a lot of what we do is for demonstration purposes as well. And this is a great example of that. I mean, here we have yet another yeah. uh, example of, of what to expect yeah. uh, if you have lower deer populations on site. And uh, our expectations here are gonna be different than the other fence that we had because of the land use history differences between the sites. Now, one more question for you because um, I, we applied to a grant called Regenerate New York to allow us to um, get a deer fence possibly because or extend our deer fence because it is really not cost effective for most, for most folks, including ourselves. However, there was some, something I hadn't heard of where they're using some kind of like 
brush technique, almost like a hugel mound or something where they're using like trees pointed outwards. Yes. Can you tell, do you know anything about I that? I do. And um, it's not one of the sites that we manage, but mm -hmm. they put one of those in at the Arnott Forest. Okay. And, um, you know, that comes with a lot of other disturbance as well. So, uh, you know, some of that is about what your land use objectives are. Okay. Right. So the Arnott Forest is a working forest. So it's, you know, timber production is part of that. If you're going to be removing tree lumber, mm -hmm. and you have all these tops, why not use them to make a, a fence that excludes deer from an area you want to have forest regeneration? Right. But the fence is not, from what I understand, is not like a post in the ground right. kind of thing. It's just like it's debris. It's the tops of yeah. the trees as, yeah. a, as a fence. Right. And, you know, it's a demonstration project. Yeah. You know, I, th I think it might be a little bit early to cast judgment on mm -hmm. it. But in terms of natural, uh, managing natural areas, mm -hmm. that wouldn't be our pre preferred alternative because we don't want to have logging as part of that. These are outdoor classrooms. Mm -hmm. We want to do, uh, you know, biodiversity conservation. Mm -hmm. So logging isn't part of our management objectives for the site. Yeah. But I will tell you, at a smaller scale, we uh, recently we removed quite a few number of ash trees on campus. And we did leave the tops of the ash trees in the woods in mm -hmm. many places even though it might look a little bit messy, because mm -hmm. it's that much more of an impediment for the deer to get into every different square inch mm -hmm. of the forest in order to browse. And so, um, you know, at a different scale, we're, we're kind of practicing the same approach. Exactly, there, and there's a practicality to it, and I appreciate that. Well, this has been marvelous to see just the progression and I'm sure if I come at any season, I'll be able to see something in bloom. I know when the last time I was in the Monday flower, flower garden, I felt like I was uh, like, you know, uh, snow white out there because everything was <laughs> seemingly in bloom and it was amazing. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for this. This has been so insightful. My pleasure. If you haven't heard yet, we'll be donating and investing 10% of our YouTube AdSense revenue from this channel back into the Finger Lakes community. We're so thankful that Espoma, our partners across both Plant One On Me and Flock Finger Lakes channels, will be matching those funds this year as well as through a combination of monies and or products, depending on the project. So just know that by watching these videos, you're helping the community here.